Hey, there I am. Let me get folks updated on my whereabouts. And then we can, can you hear me okay? Is this coming through? Hello. I don't know if people are even here. Is anyone here? This might be, <laughs> not sure if this is coming through. There's my tweet deck. So I'm in a an unnamed red state that is has a paucity of providers. And so I'm here on the road traveling. And that's why my background is different and the quality is a little bit different. And I'm hoping that this will actually work because I'm not sure how the Wi-Fi is where I'm at right now. Um, come on, tweet deck. There we go. And okay, so hopefully, folks will be able to link in and get here, and I can stop staring at random things. Um, but I will look at mentions, I suppose, because that would be a good idea. Um, so I would like to talk to folks today about um, miscarriage management, what actually happens when you have a miscarriage, what kind of miscarriages are there, how is that different from abortion and uh early pregnancy failure, and all of those things. So I want to start by saying there was a time uh, in residency when my program had told me, hey, look, um, we don't do a lot of abortions here in the training here, but don't worry because you'll be doing d &Es for uh, miscarriage, and so that's like the same thing. And it's so not. Um, someone experiencing a miscarriage, as you can imagine, is a very different patient from someone experience, uh, experiencing an abortion. And those are different scenarios as far as how you approach the patient, how you counsel them, um, informed consent and whatnot will all vary um, depending on the procedure, depending on the patient's medical history and scenario and personal um, attributes, basically. So to say that treating a miscarriage is just like performing an abortion is, that's not been my experience at all. And so that's actually what sort of led me to seek further training beyond residency in abortion care, because while a D and E uh, and D and C for miscarriage are exactly the same as they are for abortion, uh, to the, you know, patient preparation and step number one to step number 57, all of the sequence of steps are exactly the same. The patients are very different. Um, that said, it's interesting that the miscarriage patient I'm able to treat in my office without any government interference but if there's a heartbeat, I can't do the same thing, even though medically and surgically, they are identical procedures. So do with that what you will. Um, there is a lot of financial coercion and um, funny business going on there, I think, from the government. And I don't like it, but this is where we are, uh, especially in the state of Utah. I can treat a miscarriage in my office, but the same gestational weeks and the same surgical DNC procedure I cannot do under um, local anesthetic that I would do for a miscarriage. I can't do for an abortion if there's a fetal heartbeat. Uh, so that increased costs and 
uh, red tape and all sorts of things for the patient. This actually was inspired by a post I saw, a conversation between someone who had blocked me. I guess they must have un uh, temporarily unblocked me and another Twitter user about her miscarriage. And it seems that she had one at 14 weeks and was unable to see uh, the fetus and go through the grieving process like she had wanted. And that is super unfortunate. And I've taken care of many of those patients and it's never easy. It's a very difficult experience. It's a different experience for everyone. Um, we do, I think, I, I would like to hope that um, abortion providers or OBGYNs, in this case, it was probably an OBGYN who may or may not have performed abortions as well, um, provide compassionate care, even though that the outcome didn't turn out the way that she had hoped or wanted. Uh, we can't do everything that we would like to for patients, unfortunately, um, but that doesn't mean that we don't care and that we don't have compassion. So to her, I would say, I am so sorry that that happened and I did post at her as well. Um, it's, it's not always, it doesn't always turn out the way that even, you know, we docs would like. So um, that said, the, there's a lot of misinformation out there regarding abortion procedures. And again, these procedures are the same as the miscarriage management procedures that we would normally do um, if there was no fetal heartbeat. And so I just wanted to open the floor to anyone who may or may not have questions. And there's Russell. Hello, Russell. Um, I was just checking Twitter for any notifications or any uh, questions via that route. But it's easier if you come onto YouTube, click link in my thread and hang out here and post, uh, post in the chat. It's a little bit easier for me, but I'll go back and forth as I am able. So the... Medical processes, again, between early pregnancy failure management, so miscarriage, um, and first trimester pregnancy termination, abortion, are very similar. Of course, uh, the medical abortion procedure is a bit different as an aside, but the dilation and curatage procedure or the use of mesoprostol, which is the cervical ripening agents, the pills that we place generally in the vagina, sometimes uh, we'll place them in the cheeks. The patients will hold them in the cheeks for a little while so that they dissolve and get absorbed. Uh, that medication helps the uterus contract and expel through a softened cervix that has slightly opened. Um, sometimes that's all we need to do and we don't need to do an actual curatage which we will do if the bleeding is heavy or if it hasn't stopped after a period of time or we're just concerned uh, in a miscarriage. So it, again, varies by the patient. It varies by the gestational age. It varies by uh, medical conditions. You know, if there's a medical condition like a blood clotting disorder or bleeding disorder, um, that will affect our management as well. And it's interesting how I hear a lot and we see a lot on the internet about how horrible uh, DNA &E, dilation and evacuation procedure is. Uh, DNEs are different from DNCs, dilation and curatage, uh, in the gestational age. And so while a dilation and curatage is actually using uh, like rods to that get, gradually get bigger in diameter to gently open the cervix. We use them in sequence so that we can gently open the cervix, the uterine opening, which is the cervix. Um, and then we introduce what is called a curette, which is essentially like a straw. And then applying suction either manually or electronic, electrically uh, through an electric vacuum machine, we apply suction and that will empty the contents of the uterus, and that is a dilation and curatage. Long gone are the days of actually using the metal 
a curette. So the metal curette doesn't, is not a tube, it's, it's an interesting instrument with a loop on the end. And we place that at the top of the uterus, which is called the fundus. And then we bring it back against the walls of the uterus in a, in a process like this. And that is a, a sharp curettage using a blunt instrument. Uh, we do use that in some instances, of course, but generally when performing a dilation and curettage is done with the uh, straw-like implement, which is the um, curette. Dilation and evacuation goes into a further gestational age. So into your 15 week uh, pregnancies and beyond where we dilate the cervix using a variety of methods, not just the rods, but oftentimes we use different medications. Um, we'll use what's called laminaria, which is actually little um, matchstick size things of dried seaweed. Um, we'll place those inside the small cervical opening called the os, and we'll let those sit inside overnight. And since it's dried seaweed, really, um, overnight that will absorb the fluids from the body and expand. And so you have a gradual dilating of the cervix overnight, such that uh, the next day the procedure can be performed for later gestational ages. Later gestational ages, larger fetuses. Um, you know, miscarriages or abortions, anything involving a DNC or a DNE can be viewed as very icky. It can be really grotesque. Um, it's been described, the DNA specifically has been described as barbaric. I get that. I get that. No one enjoys um, doing a DNE when you do have to dismember the fetus. It is not fun. Um, unfortunately, there's no technology that we have right now that we can perform the procedure that works to avoid that. Um, I will do what I can for patients as far as, you know, my patients will ask for footprints. Um, I do what I can there. I'm often able to obtain footprints for the patient, even though they're won't be an actual remains of, of their baby, you do what you can as far as memorabilia. Um, that's just compassionate care if they want. And that's for miscarriage and abortion. I've had people terminating pregnancies who still wanted that as well, and I'm happy to do that. Everyone approaches their own pregnancy very differently. And I think the important thing is, is that we provide compassionate care. Um, so while, yeah, DNAs can be gross, they can be awful and they can be too much for even the most pro-choice person to handle. Um, you can be, you know, all about providing abortion care and wanting to do abortions. And yet some people can't handle that procedure and that's fine. That's the, and that's just the way it is. I can handle that procedure. Um, I won't say that it doesn't affect me. It does. I wish there were a technology that was gentler to the fetus and that was gentler to the patient. I would implore those who are throwing all sorts of money into campaigns to stop abortion. I'm telling you right now, you're not gonna stop abortion. Abortion will always be needed. But what you could do is throw money into medical technology that reduces the need for abortion. It, promotes education in planning pregnancies. It promotes access to birth control and, and the highly effective methods like implants and IUDs because you know who doesn't get abortions generally? People who wanna be pregnant. Now, mother nature sadly will ensure that sometimes abortion is needed even for very wanted pregnancies. Uh, things can go wrong. And an abortion is the most compassionate thing to do for both mom and baby. And that's up, to, that's up to mom, that's up to the one who's pregnant to decide that. But I would so much rather see advancements in medical technology and research that if you don't like the idea of a DNE, a dilation and evacuation procedure that is most likely going to result in the dismembering of the fetus, come up with something, come up with something different. 
I'm all about it. I will happily, happily use a new technology as long as it's as effective, if not more effective, and as safe, if not safer. Please, the, no one is saying that we have to do it this way forever, but no one is putting money into changing it. So to those who are against this, what they would call barbaric and what I can understand why they would call it that procedure, to you I say, then let's, let's make it different. Let's, let's change the technology, but this is the technology that we have. And I don't know of any trials going on where that's gonna change anytime soon. So I don't know, stop calling me a monster and stop saying that I'm barbaric because I use the tools that I only have because no one will develop any new tools. I, I mean, I don't, know what, I don't know what to tell people. You know, it's, have you seen a C-section? By the way, C-sections, also not pretty. They're not awesome. So during a C-section, we go through, you know, the abdominal wall, we go through the skin, through the fat, down through the muscles. In a part of the C-section, once we get into the abdominal cavity, the, my assistant, for example, on the other side of the patient, he or she and I will hold on to the abdominal wall and pull in opposite directions to stretch open the abdominal cavity, namely the rectus abdominis muscles, so that we can get the baby out. And that in and of itself is like, you're just like, and you're like tearing open the midline of the patient. No one's complaining about that. That's kind of awful and barbaric, but it's what we do because we have a baby to get out and your abdomen's only so big and babies are not small, hopefully, um, generally. So that is why we do that. There's lots of gross things in medicine. There's lots of gross procedures I have to do. And I don't not do them because they're gross. I have to take care of a patient. A patient needs a procedure. That may not be the prettiest procedure according to some poll somewhere of the general public. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how beautiful or ugly something in medicine is. If somebody needs that, they need it. And you do that for the patient. If I could pick and choose the procedures that I did and I only did the ones I liked, I mean, come on, what? No, that doesn't happen. I mean, maybe it, maybe it does. I guess. I don't know. But no, in, in my experience, that doesn't generally happen. Um, I have a very consistent reason for the way or for why I do things. Sorry, I'm on a wobbly table. Uh, for example, I perform abortions because I value patient autonomy. And I do not perform circumcisions because I value patient autonomy. And circumcisions are not medically indicated and the patient can't consent. And so I don't perform them. I will counsel and I will refer um, because I am trained to perform them, but I won't based on my own personal ethics. And Russell says that, I'm sure you know and understand all too well is that forced birth advocates have no interest in more compassionate or efficient abortion procedures. They want it to be horrible. I get that. Um, that may be the case. It seems like it's the case only because those who are against abortion are not coming out with anything different. They're just shaming and, you know, marching with torches and pitchforks against those of us who provide abortion, against those who are obtaining abortions. They're not really doing anything to help. They're causing more damage. People's, people are losing lives because clinics are being shot at. Um, doctors' houses are being shot through. There are clinics that are being bombed. This is not helpful. Um, it's the same strategies, quote, anti-government, end quote, right-wingers use in the sabotaging their own agencies so they can say, quote, look how horrible this agency is. It should be abolished, end quote. It's totally unfair to you and your patients, but fairness isn't the issue for them. That's, that's, those are all fair points. <laughs> Sorry about being so wordy. It's okay, Russell. Um, I appreciate your input. And 
that's, I mean, I'm at least trying to reduce the need for abortions by educating, by providing education that is not sex negative, um, education that is sex positive, that that acknowledges that human beings are sexual creatures um, by nature, and that acknowledges there's a whole spectrum of sexuality from asexual to pansexual, somewhere, uh, everyone kind of falls somewhere on that spectrum. Um, I am doing educations uh, around contraception, so avoiding pregnancy when you don't want to be pregnant. People who don't get abortions are the ones who are generally not pregnant. If you are pregnant when you want to be pregnant, also you're generally not having an abortion. And as I said before, Mother Nature isn't perfect all the time, and sometimes there may be a need for an abortion. However, that's not the typical case. The typical case is someone who wants a pregnancy gets pregnant and doesn't have an abortion because they're having a wanted pregnancy. That's the goal. I feel like that's a goal we can all get behind. But in order to get behind it, we have to acknowledge that people, and especially women, because it seems like women don't get to have a sexuality. That's a whole nother talk. We have to acknowledge that people, that human beings are sexual by nature, that we have sex with each other, that orgasms produce oxytocin, which increases bonding with your partner. We are social creatures. Sex is one of the ways that we bond with other people. Sex is one of the ways that we are social with each other. And so, yeah, sex can lead to pregnancy. No one is denying that. But how about we promote planning of pregnancy while acknowledging that people have sex and people have sex outside of the man-made institution of marriage? I have not encountered a partner that I am willing to tie myself legally to. I am still a sexual being. And I want to have sexual relationships with other people, not necessarily with somebody I've decided is someone I'm going to be legally bound to. I don't, I don't know why, as a culture, we accept, like we openly accept that sex outside of marriage is bad. This is not Victorian era England. We are not of that society anymore. And the fact that we allow that to be a, a concept, especially in our schools for our children, instead of teaching them how to have a healthy sexual relationship with somebody, and that doesn't necessarily mean penis and vagina or like genital play, just a healthy relationship that may involve a physical attraction only. And that's there. And how do you navigate that? Like, why aren't we talking to our teenagers in school about what consent is and what positive body image is and what talking to your partner about, yes, I like this. No, I don't like that. And it doesn't have to be in the fear mongering. Oh, all the kids are going to have sex now. No, when you educate them and research shows this, their curiosity is abated a bit and they put off having sex. They have sex later when they're more ready. When you leave it as this like mysterious thing that you don't ever talk about, they're having sex at an earlier age. This is not rocket science. You tell somebody, don't eat, don't eat it of that tree, right? What's the first thing they're going to want to do? Eat of the tree. And then you've got the Adam and Eve debacle. Crazy, right? So I think that if we had just more open discourse about sex, sexuality, what relationships should look like, what consent is especially, then you're talking about all of these different aspects of culture and society that are improved because now women are no longer objects that birth babies or are there for men's pleasure and sexual assault hopefully will be reduced. You have planned pregnancies because it's okay to use birth control and have sex with somebody and avoid pregnancy until you're ready. Like that's okay. 
it should be okay. It's absolutely okay. It's like the best okay ever. Planned pregnancies are the healthiest pregnancies. Again, this is just science. This is just what we know as far as the advancements of medical technology and information. Um, I should not be spewing anything that's new to anybody. I'm not seeing any questions from Twitter. Do any of you all have questions? I'm going to have to possibly go soon. Um, I do have a dinner engagement, but I wanted to hop on here because I was inspired um, by that post who she had had a loss and felt that she didn't get the care that she wanted. And I, my heart went out to her and I, I kind of know why things didn't turn out the way that she had wanted. It's just that we can do so much in medicine. We can't make every outcome the way that everybody kind of wants it to be. Um, so yeah, so that's what inspired this sort of ask me questions about miscarriage management versus abortion. Um, I'm sure I'll be talking about this again. And yeah, with that, I should say hasta luego because I have a thing. So thank you to all who joined and came on to watch. Thanks, Russell, for chiming in. And I will see you all later. Bye. Oh, that one. Bye.